Well, hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. We're up to the seventh in our Back to Business series of 12 webinars where we're offering you practical tips to help you rebuild on the back of recent bushfires, drought, floods and storms. My name is Megan Rogers and I'm Manager of Australian Wool Innovations Sheep Connect New South Wales, AWI's extension network in New South Wales. These webinars are hosted by Meat and Livestock Australia, Australian Wool Innovation, AWI Sheep Connect New South Wales and Integrity Systems Company with support from New South Wales DPI, New South Wales LLS and New South Wales Farmers. Our webinars are, as you know, um, if you're joining us from um, previous weeks, held weekly every Tuesday at 1pm and the aim is to offer you resources and support to help those impacted by recent events in getting back to business. The series of webinars have been set up as standalone events so that we can directly email you the recording of each webinar an hour after it's finished. That does mean though that you have to register for each webinar individually but we've sort of tried to keep that registration process as streamlined and brief as possible. So with three extra questions over and above your contact details. Uh, to assist with this, we'll email you at the conclusion of today's webinar with a link for next week's webinar so that that's just come straight to your inbox. Uh, today's recording will also be uh, posted on the Sheep Connect New South Wales website in the tools section and any handouts that we share in the webinars are also available with the corresponding recording on our website. And I know that Nathan's got quite a few of PDFs, a few PDFs there that he wants to uh, share with you. So they'll all go on our website as well. I'd also like to ask you, ask that you please answer our brief evaluation survey at the conclusion of today's webinar. Your feedback is very important to us and I can't stress this enough. All of our partnering organisations are keen to hear your feedback and are committed to providing services to you that are relevant, timely and most of all helpful to your business. Um, so I'd ask you to please take the time to answer six short questions at the end of this webinar and I'll say thank you in advance for your help with this. Now I just wanted to run through a quick bit of housekeeping for today's webinar. And um, for those of you who are joining us um, on a regular basis, apologies, because this is a little bit standard each week. Uh, but for those who are new attendees to today's webinar, welcome. Um, and you'll notice that you're all in, all of, our, whoops, all of our attendees are in listen only mode. Now, if you can't see the control panel that you can see on my screen now, click on that red arrow uh, next to that top big red arrow, well, it's an orangey color and that will expand that control panel. And then importantly, if you would like to have a look at the handouts, click on the handout little triangle next to handouts and that will open up. We've got five handouts today, not three as what you can see in today's uh, webinar, um, uh, the presentation. So yeah, click on that and that'll um, expand those out and you can download those uh, right now. Asking questions is quite easy. And basically, again, you, if you click on the little triangle next to the word questions, you can then en enter a question by typing um, and we can answer those questions at the end of today's webinar where we've got ample time for the questions. Whoops. Um, I now wanted to just introduce our polling question. And that gives us a, serves a couple of purposes. That just gives us a bit of an idea on, on um, if people have got the, the webinar working and that we can communicate with you. And it gives myself and Nathan, today's presenter, some feedback as to what your role with industry is. And I can tell by the fact that we've got plenty of people voting at the moment that we're um, all getting quite experienced at this poll question. So we've got 53% votes in at the moment. An interesting uh, mix of sheep, cattle, mixed species and advisors. We're up to 70% now. So I'll close the poll in about five seconds. Four, three, two, one. And we're up to 77% of votes in. So I'll just close that poll and share the results. Uh, people like to know um, the, the makeup of the audience as well, other attendees. So yeah, we've got a bit over 25% uh, sheep only, 
16% are cattle only, and the same number are a mixture of um, species. Uh, we've got 32% advisors on today, and 8% fall into an other category not listed in the questions. And I apologise for that, we've only got the capacity to have five options. Hide those results now. And um, yeah, thanks everyone for your patience. I'll now introduce today's presenter, Nathan Ferguson of Graminus Consulting. And Nathan's been working as an agronomist for 20 odd years and is currently located at Tumut, having um, settled in, in Tumut um, several years ago, quite a few years ago now. Um, prior to settling at Tumut, Nathan's worked in Moree, Canamble, Condoblin and Horsham. Uh, so importantly for today's webinar, his skills certainly run further afield than, than the Tumut area. Also equally as important, Nathan's got first-hand experience with um, pastures during fire recovery. And coupled with this other experience, I think he'll provide us with plenty of wisdom that's applicable in areas that are recovering from both fire and drought or flood. So welcome Nathan, and I'll now hand over to you. I'll just go to my sharing screen and I'll hand over and I'm gonna find you there. There you are. Just hand over to you and share your screen when you're ready. Okay, Perfect. I can Thanks see your screen. Now. We can see your screen and we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, everybody. It's a beautiful autumn day in Tumut. Feels very much like spring. Um, plenty of moisture about, and pasture is growing like there's no tomorrow. Bear with me a minute. My uh, mouse wheel's not keeping up with the program. So today um, I've been asked to speak about pasture, reco pasture recovery and growing more feed following um, a natural disaster such as bushfire and drought. Um, so what I'd like to run through is do I need more feed? So how, what uh, requirements do my livestock need? Um, how's my pasture at the moment? And um, do I have an opportunity to improve? And what steps can I take to to move forward and, and grow myself some more feed. So I just really want to highlight that um, pasture recovery, it's it's driven, whether it's by from drought, flood or fire, it's all driven by time. Um, how much time since the disaster began and ended um, until I can be on that pasture. So for drought, the key drivers, obviously rainfall, um, stored soil moisture, Temperature, both the ambient temperature and soil temperature. Soil fertility, so what was your soil fertility pre the drought heading in? And what have you applied, if anything, post rainfall? So having a soil analysis really gives you a, a, some data to make a decision about what you, you should or shouldn't be doing. Um, the pasture composition, so have I got a, uh, a native pasture that has got a little bit of legume in it or do I have a filarious subclover pasture that's powering away or a loosened pasture? What was the condition of that pasture pre-drought? So was it already in a run, running down state? So was it weedy or was it um, had it been overgrazed? Um, and what's it done since the rainfall? I think most of the states recovered fairly well. I know my uncle up at Corinda is uh, telling me he's got more feed than he's had for a long time and he hasn't got enough mouths to eat it. Um, so we also need to look at the grazing management. How did you graze those pastures uh, before the drought? So were they in a, a stressed condition heading in or were they uh, a good amount of biomass with good root reserves? What happened to the grazing during the drought where uh, your animals confined to containment areas? And we need to also think about um, other animals such as kangaroos and rabbits and goats, etc., that uh, are also grazing our pastures. What were they doing to the, the pastures during that drought? And again, post drought, what have post rainfall, what have you done um, with those animals? Have you allowed them access to the pasture or are they still in containment areas waiting to grow a body of feed? So the drivers are, are pretty similar. If we look at um, look at pasture recovery following fire. My experience, um, I've, I've gone through a couple of fires now. The first one was back in 2010 down in the Tuma region. Um, and obviously this recent one with the Duns Road fire and I think it was the Green Valley fire came across from um, Victoria. 
Um, so the, the drivers of recovery there are, what was your soil fertility heading into uh, the fire? What was the composition of that pasture and, and what state was it in prior to being burnt? Because the state will also determine the fire temperature. So we need to understand a bit about how hot that fire was and how fast it moved through the landscape. And then post fire, what was the uh, grazing management of those paddocks and what rainfall have we had? So let's go back to last year before the fire. Now, the same scenario with the drought. When was the last time you had a soil analysis done? So what, when was that last soil test taken and how close were your values to critical? So for us in the uh, southwest slopes and in, in our pastures, we're really fertilising to maintain our phosphorus at the critical value. And that critical value depends on your phosphorus buffering index. So every paddock we manage has got a different uh, critical value, but we all manage those paddocks to be as close to critical as possible because that means the pasture growth is only limited by 5% of its capacity. So we want that phosphorus to be nice and high and the only thing that's going to limit that growth is temperature and rainfall. When was your fertiliser applied last? Um, so did you apply some this year prior to um, the rain, autumn rainfall? or did you uh, put some out last year? And again, that's driven by your soil test result that you should be applying your, a targeted fertiliser with a targeted um, nutrient rate for your pasture. So we need to understand that. What was the pH of the soil and had it been lime? Because knowing that will give us some opportunities in the future to, to sow some different fodder crops or pastures. So what was the composition of the pasture? We need to know uh, if it's a filarious based pasture, were there weeds in there that could pose a problem? So was saffron thistle a problem? Did we control them? Was um, silver grass or volpia a problem? Or have I got a barley grass issue? Um, were the gaps between the sown species, so in this instance, filarious, were they static or were they increasing? So if they're increasing, there's more gaps available for more non-desirable species to fill the gap. And what was the performance of the pasture? Was it performing to your expectations or, or is it not doing as well as you'd like? If it's performing to your expectations pre-fire, then chances are it'll be performing to your expectation, probably exceed your expectations actually, and be back to pre-fire levels pretty quickly. If it was po performing poorly, um, then expect it to perform poorly after. So fire temperature, it's important to know a bit about fire temperature. So the next lot of data is coming straight from the New South Wales DPI pasture recovery after bushfires prime fact. Thankfully it was updated again this year and I was one of the authors back in 2010 for, for that file. Um, so all of the photos that I'm about to present are, are mine. They were all taken this year following the Duns Road fire and they range from Adelong down to Tuma. So fire temperature, CSIRO research indicates that fire, during a fire, the temperature at the soil surface can vary from 50 degrees up to 250 degrees. So it can hit 250 degrees for a, for a very short period of time and probably doesn't do a lot of damage. But if it hits 250 degrees for probably up to 10 to 30 seconds, you're probably going to do a lot of damage to that pasture. So we need to know roughly what temperature you've had and how long that temperature was there. We can't, we can't look, we can't go back in time and make those decisions, but we can look at the condition of the burnt areas to see how that, that um, changes. The other thing to note is that the, the temperatures below the surface usually don't change that much. So um, soil is a great insulator. And if you are with five centimetres under, the soil temperature is probably only changed by a few degrees. So the first thing to note is that, as we know, fires are a, a lively beast and all these uh, things vary with the landscape. So some areas will have an extremely hot burn and other areas will have a cool burn. And even within the, a paddock, the, within small areas, you'll see an extreme like this. So this is the edge of a dung pad. And this, uh, where the, if you can see my mouse outlining around the right hand side, that soil is pretty much cooked most of the seeds in there. And it, it was quite obvious and you'll see in a, a later photo, the pasture, as you can see in this one, the pasture has recovered fairly well, 
but you can see the fire has actually moved through fairly relatively quickly but what was a dung pat has burned quite hot and uh, that's what you call a very hot burn so looking at the landscape in the foreground here you can see we've probably had a very cool burn through here we've still got a lot of saffron thistles um, standing we've got good pasture recovery but if you look over the background here near my mouse where it's hovering um, this side of the, the there's a fence line running up the hill this side's my client this side's a neighbor and this side has had no control of blackberries for i don't know how long uh, but they've done a very good job in having the blackberries cleaned up but the downside is there's uh, now a large area of that paddock where they've had a very hot burn and not a lot will grow in there and you can see it's not the uh, it's certainly uh, not the flattest of country and fixing that country is going to be very difficult. Um, so controlling weeds is very important in controlling fire temperature. This side of the fence, no blackberries, only, only areas where it was a very hot burn is around old trees and, and stumps, um, but the rest of the place has had what we would deem a cool burn. So a cool burn, oh, go back up, sorry. A cool burn's where we see um, there's still dead plant material laying about, um, much of which is burnt and some non unburnt. You'll see that uh, most seed of annual clovers and annual rye grass will survive and most perennial grasses will recover. So these photos were taken, uh, this one on the left is actually in that paddock um, in the foreground that we were looking at. And you can see there that microlina and red grass has responded fairly well. There's a little bit of perennial rye grass down here that, that's reshot. Um, up here, this one's down at Tuma. It's in a cropping paddock. You can see that the fire's gone through, but there's a lot of unburnt material there. And white clover has actually responded quite well. Um, this one, I think, was at Adelong. And again, you can see uh, there's some seedlings emerging down the bottom there. Uh, Phalaris, this was taken at, on, uh, at Adelong as well, and you can see the Phalaris has recovered quite readily. The fire has gone through, taken the tops off, and, and the, it's recovered. Um, you can see down in this bottom photo on the left, there's a little bit of cooch shooting that's on top of a hill at um, Yavin Creek. Um, the fire temperature, you would have looked at it and said, well, it, it's come up there fairly hot and fast, but when you actually got out and had a look around, there's a lot of unburnt material and still plenty of burnt stems on the soil surface indicating it's a cool burn and seeing um, the reshoot it's um, will just be time for that paddock to recover so a moderate burn um, dead plant material is burnt a small amount of unburnt dead plant material remains some seed and young perennial grasses are destroyed some are growing annual grasses and weeds may be severely damaged or destroyed but again, like I said, it's rainfall that, that's the driver. Uh, these two photos on the right are uh, taken at Maragal. That's looking at subclover. This is um, in February, about five weeks, uh, four weeks after the fire has gone through. And you can see plenty of subclover germinating and emerging, some that's established. So that pasture is well on its way to recovery. The left hand side, you can see there's a, a perennial. Oh, I can't remember whether that's a perennial rye or a sedge, but the, the thing to note is there's plenty of uh, uh, broadleaf weeds that I'm pretty sure is small crumb weed, um, a, a little native chenopodium. So it's recovered fairly well and a bit of uh, ryegrass stubble left there. So a moderate burn, again, time and, and rainfall. As we start to see hotter and hotter fires, uh, sorry, we're still in the moderate burn. Again, a that's probably a Danthonia on top of a hill at Yavin Creek. Um, you would have thought that the fires come up here fairly hot and fast. Maybe there was um, nothing growing here, um, but a, a run of um, standing dry material there has burnt relatively hot, or hotter than, than other areas. The other thing to note was ants. Ants were very active very quickly after the fire, um, gathering up seeds. Uh, hot burn, dead plant material is burnt, many seeds are destroyed. Young perennial pastures and those weakened by drought and other factors will likely die. So if you had a soil test result and uh, your, your coal wall p-value was 20 parts per million below critical, then those, those plants are uh, 
got, haven't got a lot of nitrogen under them, so they will likely uh, not recover from a hot burn. Um, summer growing annual weeds are also destroyed and established perennial plants with low crowns, deep roots or rhizomes may survive and recover. So here's that photo we showed earlier of a dung patch. Again, very hot under the dung, but all the way around that, that, that um, pasture is certainly recovering. And looking at the soil surface here, um, I was trying to highlight the depth of ash and burn, but the soil temperature within about two or three centimetres hasn't changed a lot. Um, these areas, if you've got large areas of the paddock, um, you'll probably need to re-sow these. If you've got lots of dung patches across the paddock and most of the paddock's green, I'd leave the paddock and, and let Mother Nature do its thing. So a very hot burn, all plant material and seeds are destroyed. Soil surface is virtually sterilised. Um, the soil organic matter is incinerated. Uh, the soil is baked, causing reduced moisture infiltration and slow or poor plant re-establishment. So you can see this paddock, extremely hot burn here in the middle. You can see it was a crop paddock. This is down at Tuma. Um, we hadn't um, had the opportunity to pick up. The hay was stacked in paddocks and ready to go, hence the rows. Um, this paddock we've already set in motion to, uh, to replant. There was, um, out in the middle areas here, there was certainly still some perennial ryegrass that had survived the burn, um, but in where the, the, the hay was stacked, um, certainly nothing left. And anywhere in the hay rows as well, where they bailed up and there was residual stubble, certainly burnt very hot. So let's look at some data on the survival of species now. This data is from uh, Hamilton in Victoria, um, looking at the percentage of survival of perennial ryegrass plants. So where they had no fire, um, obviously 100% survive. If they had a cool burn come through, 98. A moderate burn, 79. A hot burn, more than half the plants are gone. The very hot burn is zero. So the thing to note with ryegrass is every time it rains it's going to try and put up some green leaf. So if you were hooking into this paddock that had a cool burn come across and graze that paddock too early, you could actually take more of those numbers out through your grazing management than the fire did. So very important to note that the best thing you can do on burnt pastures if you're unfortunate to be burnt in the future is to uh, get as many animals off the burnt area as possible and leave them off for as long as possible. So like I said, back in 2010, uh, fire went through Tuma. Um, the data I'm about to present is unpublished data, it was gathered by a technical assistant based out of Yas, Rob Gorman. Um, he assessed nine paddocks for me at Tuma and he also did uh, several paddocks up around Harden Way, I think in the same year. So the assessments began about six weeks after the fire and they were monitored for varying lengths. So most of the paddocks I'm going to show finished in about May. Um, a few of the paddocks went out to August or October because they seemed to linger a little bit longer. Um, the, the pastures that Rob assessed for me were uh, Phalaris, fescue, ryegrass, a mixed perennial pasture, which was mostly rye, Phalaris and fescue, um, lucerne and native pasture. So the thing to note here is, we had no, no data collected from those pastures pre the fire. So we weren't in a position to know how those pastures were performing or what the soil fertility was. So, and the thing to note is I'm only gonna present a few paddocks, but the trend was very similar for all paddocks. All paddocks recovered relatively quickly once we had rainfall and provided the livestock were, uh, were removed until there was at least 1500 kilos of dry matter. So what we've got here is a Phalaris pasture. And if we look on the left-hand side, in February, which was about six weeks after the fire, we've got uh, nearly 60% bare ground. Um, and as we went through time, through autumn, it drops down to 20 and, and 18%. So of the, the plant cover, I wanted to look at what was the composition of that pasture. So of the cover, of that 45% um, cover, in uh, February, only about 8% of that was Phalaris, about 6% was uh, a legume, probably subclover. Annual grass made up about 4% uh, 
and broadleaf weeds uh, made up about 22%. And you can see as we, we had the, our autumn break, the phalaris increased to about 22%. Legume, it really dominated and took advantage of the, the open space in that paddock, um, went up to 30 odd percent, and the broadleaf weeds as well hovered around that 15 percent. So the pastures, in this case, the pastures probably recovered back to its pre fire state. Fescue, well, uh, this fescue pasture, I, again, I, I'm not sure how much fescue was in that pasture before the fire. Uh, but you can see the levels post fire are very, very low, like so low that they're, they're probably not contributing to the feed on offer. And the majority of plants in there are broadleaf weeds and annual grasses. So my guess is that paddock was already uh, thinning out, um, whether that fescue was sown amongst, in a mix with ryegrass and, and out competed, uh, we will never know but the fescue in that environment certainly wasn't performing to expectations. Lucens are real standout. They, most of the lucens during this fire actually stopped the fire burning or slowed it down enough for the firefighters to uh, get around and put it out. So you can see the lucen recovered exceptionally quickly. Um, within uh, the month of February to uh, to March, the bare ground's gone from greater than 60% down to less than 20%, and Lucen made, made up 100% of the, the plants in that sward at uh, February, and still up around the 90% in, in March and down below 80 in April. So my guess is it's probably Shepherd's Purse, and the Shepherd's Purse was doing what Shepherd's Purse does after the autumn break and fills any gaps that subclover um, isn't in there to fill. So how do our native pastures go? Um, this was a red grass dominant pasture. Um, you can see that it, it hadn't um, bared the paddock right out. We were still just a, about 65% um, bare ground, um, but the native pasture component of that paddock is well over 50%. There's some broadleaf weeds in there. These early weeds are, are more than likely small crumb weed. Um, they've decomposed through time. And as we get our first lot of frosts, and probably replaced in that um, scenario with a mixture of um, saffron, thistles and the like. So would you do anything with this native pasture? Well, other than spraying your broadleaf weeds if required, um, you're, you're not about to run out and over sow that paddock with oats. Okay, so we, we've looked a little bit about our pastures and how they recover, but before we decide to pull that trigger and, and run oats out into an area or ryegrass or whatever your decision is, we need to look at what livestock have we got on hand. So I, I see on uh, people attending, there's a few uh, sheep only and a, a few cattle only and a few mixed farmers. Um, I assume there might be a couple of people that might have a few goats or horses or, or alpacas. So how does that compare to normal? After the fire has gone through, did you take an opportunity and send your cattle away on adjustment and keep your sheep at home? Or if you were sheep only, did you, uh, lose numbers and, and you're actually down uh, to normal. So everything we look at is how is it compared to normal? You also need to know what condition they're in. Well, have you joined them? Um, were they due to lamb in an autumn lamb or an autumn calf or are they joined to uh, lamb and calf in spring? So we need to look at that and say, well, how is that compared to normal? Are we, are we just in a normal cycle or have we slipped out and uh, and tried to take an opportunity. We need to know what condition they're in. So if they're normally a fat score two and a half, are they, are they still a fat score two and a half? Or are they, they more, are they three or, or three and a half? So again, what's normal for, for your enterprise? You need to know that. And then lastly, what are their feed requirements? How, how much pasture does it take for those animals to maintain their weight or to be uh, producing enough um, milk for offspring? So there's models available. The one I've used today is grass feed. Um, the drought and supplementary feed calculator that New South Wales DPI has put out allows you to put some pasture parameters in. So we need to understand our pastures. Have we got a temperate pasture or have we got a tropical pasture? Um, how much of that pasture is made up of green and dead? So grass feed, you put that number in, whereas in the uh, drought and supplementary feed calculator, you don't. Um, what's the legume con content of the pasture? So 
at this point in time, you, you could probably make an assessment of that legume component. Um, most places have probably had a fairly good break. I know in our area, subclover germinated back in February and it's uh, powering away and making up a significant proportion of the pasture. So in my model, I, I put in a temperate pasture, which is typical of Southwest Lopes in New South Wales. At this point, I'm actually probably underestimated. Um, I, did a tour around the farm this morning and some paddocks are, uh, are higher than one and a half tonnes, but there's not too many that are under one and a half tonnes. 30% um, legumes, probably about right. Depending on the system, there's always some dead plant material through unless you've been burnt. Um, and I estimate about 800 kilos of uh, dead. I've said we're not going to feed supplements to these animals. I haven't included uh, Weather effects, um, the model allows you to say, well, if, if it's cold and windy, like it was on the weekend, do I need to be feeding more? The animals I've looked at are three year old, 50 kilogram Reno ewes in a two and a half condition fat score, cutting about four and a half kilos of wool with a 70% yield. And I've said that this was an autumn lambing enterprise with a single lamb at foot. Now I did that because I wanted to look at what was a high demand of feed requirement at this point in time? I could have um, had them as twin bearing ewes to see what that was, but I just wanted to keep it simple and look at one. So grass feed went through and said, well, that ewe is going to be consuming just over two kilograms of, of feed, and she's going to be gaining about 55 grams per day um, and growing about 23 grams of, of wool. So all in all, there's plenty of feed in, in that system. The lambs in that system, they're going to be growing at 270 grams per day. So do we need more feed now? No. Is our system going to provide enough feed going forward? Well, that's where knowing where it's come from will help us with that. What if I have less feed? So what I did was reduce the uh, pasture from 1500 kilos to 1000 kilos and left everything else the same. So you can see we had 55 grams for our ewe. On a thousand kilos, she's going to lose 20 grams a day and, and be gaining at 35 grams. So again, still sufficient pasture for, for that ewe. And likewise, the lamb, it's only be going to be growing at seven grams um, per day less than it would be on a 1500 kilogram paddock. So do we need more feed? Um, well, I'd say probably not. So, if you were in the lucky position to say, well, we're actually lower in numbers, we've got sufficient feed on hand, um, there's an opportunity that could be knocking. So a lot of my clients, and, and not just clients, others have, have been saying about the place, um, they haven't got enough mouths to consume their current pastures. So those people certainly wouldn't have enough feed, uh, wouldn't have a requirement to be growing more feed, but that, that means there's now an opportunity where we could uh, could take to potentially sow a pasture or sow a fodder crop or sow, uh, over sow annual ryegrass into a clover based pasture, et cetera. So it gives us the opportunity to conduct practices that would have a detrimental impact to available feed into and during winter. So that's the highlight. So again, before we do anything, we need to look backwards and look at where the pastures come from, um, what's the current state, so everything I said there before, and we also need to understand what's our feed requirement in four weeks, three months, and six months time. Um, and my guess is the way the season's shaping up, especially for the south and probably central tablelands, we're in a, a condition, in a state where we've probably got enough feed now to get us through to August. So. Do we need to grow more feed? Probably not, so opportunity possibly knocks. So what tools are available to help you improve your pasture production? Now these, these ring true whether you're uh, a, a mixed farmer uh, in the cropping zone or you're, you're a grazier on the coast or, or in the tablelands. First thing is to make sure your soil fertility is at critical levels. Um, if you don't know, it's probably best to, uh, to dribble some out. Um, if you do know, certainly uh, set your, get your targeted rate. Um, we've got the opportunity to be applying uh, nitrogen, whether it's in the form of urea or, um, or sulphate of ammonia heading into winter. We'll certainly grow another feed wedge and, as well as gibberellic acid. So the things that are going to have a detrimental impact on, 
on our feed availability moving forward is winter cleaning uh, to remove weedy annual grasses um, will have a detrimental impact. Controlling broadleaf weeds, um, we've, like I said, we had the opportunity to sow those other things into or over a pasture. So let's have a look at some images here. What we've got on the left hand side is a Phalaris subclover pasture down in the Holbrook region. And on the right hand side is the same Phalaris, what should be Phalaris subclover pasture. But you can see obviously in the spring prior, it was not heavily grazed and there's a lot of dry matter carried forward. Some people may look at this system on the right and say, that's fantastic, it's low risk. And others will look at it and say, well, higher risk on the left-hand side. Um, the, the thing to, to note is you need to balance your risk as to your management system. Both systems have uh, positives and negatives. Um, this system over here, I'd say, is actually balanced. It's not over-utilising feed. Um, this side's certainly underutilising feed. And if we're going to underutilise feed several years in a row, we can run into problems. What are those problems? Well, the first one is there is no space for subclover. And when we have a lack of subclover, we have uh, lots of space for for um, silvergrass or volpia, which is um, very nitrogen hungry and very efficient at scavenging any available nitrogen. So what you end up with is a thinning phalaris stand um, and you'll end up with a, um, a weedy pasture. So in this system, you could certainly uh, look at running a slasher over, opening up space, um, controlling uh, the, uh, the weeds with a winter clean and over sowing legume. Um, looking at this paddock here on the left, well, certainly fantastic paddock, nothing to do here. On the right hand side, why, why is this pasture in that state? I don't know, uh, but my guess is it's probably low in phosphorus. You can see there's certainly subclover in there. Um, is it a combination of low fertility and grazing management? Not sure, but there's certainly some levers available to the producer on this side to improve the pasture to look more like the paddock on the left. Again, a, a pasture with a, a bit of capeweed and uh, cat's ear or dandelion, a bit of soft brome and volpia, um, a few dung and urine patches. So there's an opportunity in there to, to manipulate a pasture like this this winter and take an opportunity next year to over -sew. But I won't spend too much time. So these photos are very similar. Again, there's a bit of red in the background. So sorrel, probably, possibly an ind indicator that's an acid soil. Um, lots of vulpia again, but there's still subclover. So my guess is a paddock like this is uh, low in phosphorus and has a low pH, and you could certainly do something to improve productivity without having to sow, uh, spray it out and sow again. Uh, same there. So winter cleaning, and then following up that winter cleaning with an over -sow, we have an opportunity to do that this year, um, especially if you've got sufficient feed moving forward and you can take a hit on your winter production. I'm not going to cover that any further than, than uh, here. Um, Jim Vagana and uh, Tim Prance and, um, and Sandy McEachran presented on that on the MLA uh, webinar last Tuesday night. So if you'd like to uh, go and download that recording, uh, by all means, go and look into winter cleaning a bit further. Um, Fiona Leach and team put this together back in 2009 look what tools are available to rejuvenate a perennial pasture. Um, so they were looking at winter cleaning, soil fertility, grazing management, etc. So I'm not going to step too much more into them there. Um, so there's always the opportunity to over sow into paddocks that weren't weedy. So if you had a, an annual legume pasture that uh, was dominant with legume and didn't have much grass in it, you could certainly over sow an annual rye grass or a cereal into that to, to uh, balance that pasture out. And likewise, over sowing a legume into a grass dominant pasture, only if you've controlled your broadleaf weeds or your, uh, your annual weedy grasses like Volpia. So many producers, like I said, have got more feed than mouths to eat it. And over sowing will add more feed to that wedge. So you need to have the the ability to either utilise that feed, so graze it or cut and bale it or purchase some trading stock. So I think uh, if you're in that scenario where you need more feed, what can we do? So we could re a perennial pasture, which we call a full renovation. If the process and planning 
has been in place prior to the fire then or drought, then carry on with your normal plans. And if you didn't start last year, the risk of failure is much higher because you're going to have a lot more um, competition for those emerging weak perennial seedlings. So I can't stress enough that you really need to seek advice from an independent, independent qualified agronomist in your area. And I do want to note that that agronomist is hopefully only recommending you to sow species that you want to survive. So for us, Phalaris is our species that dominates most pastures. And if you want Phalaris to be there forever, there's no point adding ryegrass into that system because ryegrass as a seedling will outcompete the Phalaris. And if we have a dry spring, we'll end up with a uh, fantastic ryegrass pasture if, you, if it was ryegrass that was the weed and a poor perennial Phalaris after. Um, so I can't stress enough, make sure you seek good advice and only sow the species that you, you know will persist. Okay, so hopefully you, you're all aware of the ideal preparation for establishing a perennial pasture. With us and our clients, it starts prior to two years prior to sowing. So in year one, we'll look at a winter clean. And this system is for the, for the producer who doesn't want to lose a whole lot of productivity by spraying a, a pasture out in spring, generally following through to the following autumn and sowing a, uh, a winter forage crop. So this system allows us to winter clean, reduce the amount of annual grasses that are going to set seed. In year two, we come out in spring and we stop all seed set. And then in year three, we sow our pasture. By all means, you can spray it in spring, sow a forage crop in year two, uh, but you must stop all seed set in that next spring. So whether it's through cutting silage or, uh, or grazing it and spraying it out. Not a big fan of hay, hay tends to drop a lot of seed and if there's some uh, barley grass or silver grass or soft brome come through this winter cleaning or the spring spray out, you will end up with competition for your new pasture the following year. So the temperate perennial pasture establishment guide was put out by New South Wales DPI. I was one of the authors of that. I think it took us about six or seven years to get it to the point where it could be uh, could be published, um, restructure came through and all of the authors, uh, most of the authors left the department and it was left to others within the department and it came out in about 2013, I think, which is uh, about seven years after the process started. So within that, that guide is a checklist as to how to prepare a paddock. So if you've done no preparation, where you're stepping in this year is, we're looking at absolute weed and pest control. So if you don't get this right this year, the risk of failure is, is huge. So you probably want to be withholding your sowing until the majority of uh, annual grassy weeds are, have germinated. So that could be June, um, but you also need to make sure there's sufficient time for your legume and your phalaris or your, your, your other sown species to get up and establish and, and get through the spring to ensure it's um, going to survive the summer and be there for next year. There's the same guide for tropical perennial grasses, um, again, put out by New South Wales DPI, but I really wanted to highlight this photo. So if you don't control your grasses in the year prior to sowing, this is the issue we have. Um, you can see fantastic rows of perennial tropical grasses in the background and lots of annual summer grasses in the foreground. So if you're in the, in the north of the state and the sowing tropical species, it's very important that you also reverse the strategy, stop all those spring germinating, uh, summer growing annual grasses setting seed in the year prior to sowing and, um, and progress. But again, seek um, independent advice. There's plenty of good advisors up in the north of the state, uh, Bob Freeban and uh, Lester McCormick to name but two. So my, my message is if your livestock numbers are, forecast, are lower now than they, they have been in the past and they're forecast to be low for the next couple of years, is there any need to rush this year, especially if, had, if you've had a fire go through and you've sent animals away on adjustment uh, because when we send them away on adjustment, hopefully they're not coming home, they're heading uh, to an abattoir or somewhere else at the end of their adjustment period. So there's no need to rush. I, so I, I look at it and say, if you've... Uh, got the time, let's spray out what you've got and put a fodder crop in and get out every, 
tick all our boxes so our perennial pasture can uh, survive. So again, make sure you seek plenty of good advice to help you work out where you sit compared to normal and where you'd like to go. So just in summing it up, um, this is a back to business uh, flyer for the fire affected producers. Um, so producers in those fire affected regions can now access up to three free one on one sessions with a local farm management consultant to help put their business back on track. Uh, make sure you get in touch with uh, Holmes and Sackett or John Francis in Wagga there and, and register your, uh, your needs for that. It's a fantastic opportunity to one, make sure you've got your finances uh, sorted and two, to seek some free agronomic advice to help you plan moving forward and recover. So I think that's about it there, Megan. If we've got any questions, you there, Megan? Yep, sorry, just a bit slow on muting um, myself there, Nathan. So I guess thank you for, for what you've um, just presented now, Nathan. We've got um, about 15 minutes um, to take some questions. I just wanted to um, highlight, we've had, had a, a comment come through saying um, how much, and it's from Kirsty saying, great use of images and the, the content's been excellent. I guess one question that, that comes to mind in regards to some of the comments that you've made, Nathan, particularly about not rushing, is that there is a, a really, really good opportunity if our stocking, if our farm stocking rate is lower, to go around and have a, a clean set of eyes, have a look at our, the state of our pastures and come up with a plan of attack so that um, you know next year or, or when you know when further you know stocking rates back to normal the business is really in a position that can you know drive that productivity going forward so I guess what I've, I've sort of taken from this is is um, you know do we do a whole farm fodder budget do we get someone to come out and have a bit of a look around and go right when's our peaks and troughs and you know how are we going to manage this I think so, Megan, like with your background as well, most farmers have got a rough idea about where their highest feed demand is, but do they actually measure the, measure it? Do they know the actual numbers around it? Um, I think having the ability to get someone to come in and help you look at your business as a whole and look at your feed demand and your feed supply across the calendar year and vary that with different seasons, um, there's plenty of models out there where you can say, well, what if I have uh, a decile five year or compare that to a decile two or a decile eight year? How does my pasture production look and what what triggers can I pull to utilise the feed in, in each of those scenarios? So I think it's a great opportunity, especially if you've been impacted by drought or fire. I think having that extra set of eyes come onto your place and ask you questions, particularly as an advisor, I like to understand why people do what they do um, and not so much change what they do, but to understand there's a better way out there. And if people have looked at that better way and, and discounted it for whatever reason, because their system suits their lifestyle, for instance, or their their system suits their, their profit and loss balance sheet, um, as long as people understand that why they do what they do, I think having those extra set of eyes helps them understand why they do what they do. It's, it's such an important, and, and I guess it's for a lot of people, a great opportunity where their pastures have really started to come back and, and they've got plenty of feed for reduced numbers. It's a great opportunity uh, to say, rightio, well, you know, going forward, um, you know, here's an opportunity to really, you know, beef up the pastures that we've got. I guess, um, yeah. yep. sorry, Nathan. Yeah, I was, I was about to say, and to also, um, if you haven't been measuring, especially soil fertility, it's an opportunity you've got in front of you to, to actually start to look at, well, where, benchmark your system, where is, where's my critical value? How do I sit in relation to that? And what can I do to change it? So when we come onto a place for the first time and soil sample, we see this time and time again, we've got um, a place that'll have paddocks that are well over fertilised and, 
and paddocks on the same place that are well under fertilized and some that are uh, at and around critical and every place is the same um, so if you can make have efficiency gains in in the system um, i I highly recommend people look at it and and start measuring so that they can manage better. And I guess some of those photos that you um, presented really highlight the opportunity that exists that it might be simply you know restoring some fertility back to a, um, a tired pasture that'll really ramp it up and and um, get it cranking and and doing you know great things again as opposed to having to undertake the cost of of um, starting from scratch. Yeah, and we see it time and time again with our, our clients, Megan. You look at, you go in your soil sample, you'll, you'll pick up all these paddocks that are well below critical and, and quite often 20 parts per million below critical. And you start pouring fertiliser on 250 kilos of single super. And for two and three years, they're saying, when am I going to see a result? And I always say, well, the fourth year is your year. Um, you're, you're only building phosphorus very slowly. Um, you're going to grow more subclover, and the year they grow more subclover, they go, wow, this is it. And I say, well, no, next year's your year. You're you're about to have a big injection of nitrogen into your system, and lo and behold, that fourth year, they all go, wow, what a place. I, I wonder where this came from. And it's, yeah. it's just measuring and monitoring soil fertility. So irrespective of whether we've had um, drought or or fire, there's there's opportunities now to go back and go, right, yeah, let's have a look at our paddocks. You know, our priorities might have been X, Y, Z. Um, you know, maybe get a fresh set of eyes to come and, and have a look. And particularly if you're eligible for the back to business uh, consultancy, um, FYI people, that um, is um, current until the end of June, um, from what I understand. Um, but there's there's a real opportunity there to go, okay, let's take a step back and have a fresh look at this and, and find out where we're going to get good bang for our bark that's really going to deliver us dividends. Yeah, correct. And and look, a lot of the times in those scenarios, we do look backwards a lot um, to gauge how do we get to where we are today before we start to engage first gear and, and move forward with a plan. So yeah, it's a great opportunity, whether you're going to financially benchmark or uh, or look at your pastures and, and put a plan together. It, it gives you a, a great opportunity to look back and say, how did we land here today? And where do we want to be in five years, 10 years time? And, and start a planning process. Yeah, I, mean, I guess I guess out of, you know, some of these um, devastating scenes that we've seen, be it drought, flood, fire, and, you know, with the season starting to turn around, there's, there's really some opportunities there with, with some favourable seasons to, to kickstart things. Got a question from Kirsty. Um, in a fire-prone area, um, are there species that are more resistant, um, you know, within reason, like balanced up against production for the non-fire years that you'd recommend? Um, so anything green is a great uh, fire retardant. Um, so perennial ryegrass can be a, a great retardant. Um, summer active fescue can be a fire retardant, but the key is it's, it's got to be green and, and dry matter um, has to be out of it. So I think every place, every property should have a fire plan and that fire plan should include a paddock that whether it's lucerne or summer active fescue or perennial ryegrass that's grazed down fairly short and well around the houses, generally the western or northwestern side of the house to, and sheds to act as a fire break. Um, I think most places should be looking into a system like that in the future. So, again, not knowing where Kirsty's from, for us, it's certainly, uh, it'd be uh, loosen as number one and, and perennial rise number two as we, we get higher in elevation. Um, other areas, I'd, I'd, you'd have to seek advice as to what's the most suitable species to be growing through that uh, high summer risk. But again, look, some of those fires that came through in summer this year, it didn't matter what past you had, didn't matter how much dry matter was there. The fire was so ferocious with the, the conditions we had that it just wasn't stopping. So, yeah, I, I think with with uh, the modelling I've seen and, and spoken to some climate scientists, um, they, they say that we will see this again, unfortunately. Um, and I, I don't know what we can do moving forward except plan for um, having some green paddocks through summer and, and for us, loosens probably it. 
Yeah, it's interesting that you, you mentioned that, that loosen had really had a retardant type of effect. So, yeah, something, again, you know, getting some local input into that. Um, just moving on from um, the point about loosen, how does heat impact on the nodulation of legumes? That's another one from Kirsty. Thanks, Kirsty. Uh, great question. Again, like I said, if if most of your nodules are in that top 10 millimetres of the soil, you may lose some, but since the, the soil is such a, a great insulator, you won't have much of an effect. So it'll all depend on the conditions, the soil conditions, so whether your, your critical value for loosen is not known, but we do know it's higher than subclover. Um, so knowing your, your Coldwell P value will be a big driver if, if it's very low. Um, as a fire comes through, you probably have a greater a detrimental impact on your uh, nodulation. If you're at critical, probably less. But again, it, it's how hot that fire came through. And in my experience, I haven't seen a very hot fire in a loosened paddock unless they've had uh, bales of hay or silage in the paddock that hadn't been picked up. The rest of the paddock, it, it generally recovers fairly well. So I'd, I'd assume it might be a very short um, impact on the nodules, but nodulation, but not much. Thanks, Nathan. Just with regards to some short-term strategies, if if we've um, we've got a situation where we really want to think about going forward and and um, re-establishing some pastures, but I've got plenty of livestock on hand and the pastures aren't coming away. Do you want to just um, can you just touch a little bit on on the role of of forage crops and some short-term uh, grazing opportunities for people out there who, who want to try and get some fast feed away um, and take the opportunity to use the, the moisture that's about to, to redevelop some pastures? Yep, so again, I'll, I'll speak broad brush um, to, to get some um, local independent advice will certainly um, narrow it down for most people. But look, you've got forage brassicas, you've got cereals, you've got, uh, so in the cereals, you've got oats, barley, wheat, rye corn or cereal rye, triticale, um, all of which will uh, germinate and grow relatively quickly and give you feed anywhere from six to probably eight, 12 weeks time, depending on the species and the soil fertility. Um, the same with brassica and how long you, how you manage that and where you, you're situated in the, in the landscape will determine how long that feed will grow. Um, if you're in a more favorable area, ryegrass is always your friend. Um, sowing an annual rye or an Italian rye, knowing that it's it's only in there for a short period of time is, is another good way to go, probably a little bit longer to get to grazing. So forage crops are a fantastic opportunity um, if you need that, that feed in that um, eight to 12 week window, I suppose. So I'm lot, lots guess. of different types and species, but again, it, it comes back to, you need to know your pH, well, well a brassica handle and the acid soil, probably not. So if you've got an acid soil, you, you'll have to lime it to, to put a brassica in. So understanding or knowing your soil fertility status is, is probably key to determining which species is most suitable. So it's again, it's not a one size fits all, but certainly there's opportunities there if you do have, have some of those paddocks that you showed earlier that are a bit weedy, that you can um, utilise to, to um, you know, pull that out of, of um, pasture production, but still maintain production if you're a little bit light on um, on biomass and and um, and feed, uh, still an area to sort of build yourself a bit of a wedge and, and keep your livestock going forward. Yeah, that's right. So there's always the opportunity to run out a bit of gramoxone or spray seed to, uh, to knock what's growing back and try and um, level the playing field for your seedlings to establish. Um, if you were lucky enough to get something in the ground prior to the rain last week, um, even with a head start, uh, I don't think some of those plants will um, outcompete a, a cereal seedling. So there's always opportunities available, but to, to get um, have a prescription written to you, I suggest you get a local come and, uh, and, and identify your system and get to know what's happening on your farm and what your requirements are, and they'll be able to help you fulfill a prescription. And I, th I think that's such a, an, an important way to sort of round up our discussion today, Nathan, that 
that there's opportunities that exist to um, to make use of what you've got on farm and you know as well as you know re-establish pastures going forward and a second set of eyes are really critical in that space so I think um, I think we might draw the questions to a close there now and um, thank you to everybody who has um, forwarded their questions um, certainly they were great great questions um, just got another quick comment there very informative and clear ideas thank you thanks Gail for your feedback there um, and I guess just wanted to um, thank you Nathan for your insights today it's, it's been very valuable really importantly very practical and I've taken a lot of um, um, information away from today in, in terms of not everything is a disaster there could be great great opportunities come out of some of these um, situations and again you know it may be a matter of, of thinking further ahead and saying well let's just put some um, some extra pee on some pastures to um, see if we can get some um, you know longer term productivity out of those um, and I just wanted to thank everybody else today um, who've joined us um, we're very pleased with the number of attendees. We've had quite a, a number of people register for today. Um, and a couple of final reminders about our evaluation questions. We'd really appreciate you to, um, if you could fill those uh, questions in and let us know what future topics you'd like to hear. We do look over the evaluations after each of our webinars. Uh, don't forget to register for next week's webinar, which is about opportunities to drive livestock operations. Um, with a, a focus on enterprise options and genetics. Um, the, the Rego link will come straight to your email inbox this afternoon. Um, the, we also produce podcasts as part of the Back to Business program. Um, so if you like to receive your information via a podcast or you know someone who does, then jump onto where you receive your podcasts from and search Back to Business and subscribe and they'll come automatically um, into your little podcast folder on your device. Uh, so thanks again, everybody, for your time today. We know how busy people are and appreciate the time that, that everyone's taken to participate, as, as well as yourself, Nathan. So thanks for that. So in closing, just on behalf of Meat and Livestock Australia, Australian Wool Innovation, AWI Sheep Connect New South Wales, Integrity Systems Company, New South Wales DPI, Local Land Services and New South Wales Farmers, best wishes and a very good afternoon to you all. And we look forward to catching up with you next week at our th uh, Tuesday webinar. Thanks everyone. And thanks again, Nathan. Thanks Megan. Thanks everyone.